Hey, good morning. Um, so I put up there the same diagram that I had um, that I had previously. It's just a summary of the definition of a Cairo Siegel CFP, and it's um, all in more detail on your handout if you haven't put another piece of the, of the handout. Have a look around, maybe someone else does. Um, so what did we do? We talked about the various items in there. There was one thing that required a particular uh, amount of care, which is to how to define the central extension of the semi-group of anilai. So anilai <coughs> fits your one manifold S and nanolus is just a special type of cobordism that um, in the topological sense doesn't do anything, it's just an analyst. Um, but the semi-group of anilai admits the central extension by, um, so the universal central extension is has center complex numbers cross Z, and here we're taking a quotient of complex numbers cross Z, which is isomorphic to C star cross Z, and which subgroup of C do we mod out is encoded by this parameter, which is a real number called the central charge. And uh, so this whole thing depends on a central charge, and we're talking about this in formal field theory of central charge C. And um, then uh, there is the condition that this particular map is holomorphic, which uh, is responsible for the adjective chiral in chiral CFT. I want to tell you about some examples of um, chiral and formal field theories today. So, um, there, um, there are two. Okay. Yes. <coughs> yes. Um, the the sets of group is you need to determine once you pick the composable charge. So it's C determining both the sort of map from C times cross Z. <clears throat> Sorry, the Z subgroup, what about it? it is it already determined once you think the conformal charge? Um, this one doesn't care about a central charge. This is just yeah. the universal cover of this. Just as a topological space, you take this space, it's homotopy equivalent to S1, you take its universal cover, that produces a new semi-group where there's a map down to the thing without the central, and that kernel is Z, the kernel of that map is Z. So you, you start by taking this universal cover, and then once you have that, you do something that involves a Lie algebra co-cycle. So you write down the co-cycle, and then there's this general machine that has you given a Lie algebra co-cycle on something simply, and a simply connected Lie group, and in this particular case, it's not a Lie group, but it's close enough that we were able to sort of make the machine work. You get a central extension by, um, Something which is essentially what, like if you take a Liège by cycle with values in C, you take the central extension is again with values in C, possibly with a correction having to do with pi 2 of this thing. This thing has no pi 2, and therefore there's no correction, it's just a central extension with values in C. Um, but that's not the one that I wrote there. I took a quotient of that central extension. So this is not the universal central extension, this is a quotient of the universal central extension. Um, there's uh, okay. There's a class of examples called the minimal models, the chiral minimal models, um, in the language of vertex operator algebras. These the these vertex algebras are called the Virasoro um, vertex algebras. Um, and there is one for every value of the central charge, but um, only for very specific values of the central charge will this be a rational uh, conformal field theory. And because this formalism only talks about rational conformal field theories, that's this finiteness assumption that I told you about, the condition that this category has finitely many objects. Um, so we will be forced to restrict to this set of values 
So um, central charge has to be of the form 1 minus 6 over m times m plus 1, where m is a parameter that is equal to either 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 and so on. Um, so this is a countably infinite family of uh, models, and uh, these numbers are um, just a sequence that uh, converges to 1. Um, for values c equals 1 and higher, um, these things still exist, but the categories are no longer things with finitely many objects, and it, you need to modify the setup, which I don't want to do right now. Um, and another one which is important is the Cairo Vestumina Witten models. Um, there's um, so there is one for every uh, simple, simply connected compact Lie group G. Um, that is called the gauge group. Um, and you need also an integer, which is called the level. So for every pair G comma K, there is one such chiral conformal field theory, um, which is a WZW model for G and K. At the level of vertex algebras, these are known as the um, affine vertex algebras or affine cap smoothie vertex algebras. Anyways, uh, there's a couple of different names for the same things. Um, so, um, <coughs> these models are intimately related to the vertex algebra. These models are intimately related to the affine cat smoothie Lie algebras. So I need to uh, possibly remind you a little bit what these things are, and we've seen them, but um, there's no harm in um, throwing the formulas on the board again. Um, so, okay. So how does it go for this here? Um, there was, first of all, uh, the bit algebra, which is um, the algebra of vector fields on the standard circle, and it's complexified vector field, so that, so there's a Lie algebra over the complex numbers. Um, it has generators um, that satisfy Ln, Lm, Lie bracket equals uh, equals this. So that's a very nice Lie algebra. That's a basis of the n run over the integers. Then we found a co-cycle for that. And um, if you uh, include the, the, like if you write down the formula for the centrally extended Lie algebra, which is now called the Virasoro algebra, it is standard to then switch to using capital L's. And then we have Ln Lm, which is that same formula. plus this extra term, which is um, C over 12, M cubed minus M, uh, and then M needs to be equal to minus N for this term to appear. And the basis of this Virasoro algebra consists of these Z many LNs and a single extra element, which is um, denoted sometimes just by one. Um, and when I write this, I mean this number times this extra element one. Um, and we call it one because in any representation of the Virasoro algebra, we're going to insist that this element one acts by the identity operator on my vector. So when I say a representation of this Lie algebra, I don't mean an arbitrary representation. I mean a representation such that this element one acts by one. And that makes... Uh, the category of representations of the, of the Virasoro algebra depend on this central charge. Because these otherwise would all be isomorphic as Lie algebras. There's just an easy isomorphism 
from perhaps C and C prime to different things, as Lie algebras are isomorphic. But as Lie algebras with distinguished element, they're not. The isomorphism just scales this distinguished element. Great. So we have um, that. And um, a priori, uh, we can take the complex, uh, the central charge to be any, uh, any real number, and this will make sense. Actually, you could take it to be any complex number, and this would make sense. Um, but eventually, uh, these are the only uh, values that are going to be important. Um, OK, and then uh, at the level of um, groups or semi-groups integrating these Lie algebras, um, we have seen, so if I take the real form of this Lie algebra, namely just vector fields, not complexified vector fields, the group that corresponds to that is um, the group of diffeomorphisms of S1, to be more precise, orientation preserving diffeomorphisms, and then the universal central extension of that um, has kernel Z cross uh, something real one-dimensional, which I think it makes most sense to talk about it as being I times R. And then we take a quotient of this I times R by something and you get an S1, which I'm going to write uh, as uh, maybe U1. U1 cross Z maps to this group, which, um, uh, whatever, I'll just write this S1 with a big tilde on it um, to indicate this. And this depends on the central charge. So I put the central charge as it. Um, and then we have the corresponding um, thing for the anilai. Anilai. Now the central extension involves C star, the Z remains what it was, and then we have. And this thing with the tilde is just an alternative notation for this. This is just the same group written in a different way. Um, so these are the objects that are going to be important for describing this thing here. Let me directly talk about um, uh, the, the Lie algebras that are relevant for the WZW models. So, um, well, the algebras and the groups, somehow I'm, so the first thing that, you, I mean, I talked about that very briefly at the end of yesterday's talk. Um, maybe I should write here all the properties of, that the G has. This is simple, compact, and simply connected. And there are ways of restricting those conditions, but I won't worry about that today. Um, so the first thing that you do is, um, the, the thing that we care about eventually is the loop group, which is the group of maps from S1 into G. Um, and then it's Lie algebra. Uh, so I write little g for the Lie algebra of big G. Um, the Lie algebra of this is just maps from S1 into this little g, which is the same thing as <coughs> C infinity functions. Um, there is a certain inner product which is important that goes from G cross G to um, let's see um, to R. These are I guess that's really, I guess a, a real Lie algebra. Um, called the basic inner product. So the basic inner product is um, an, an invariant inner product. So the action of big G on little g uh, acts on the set of inner products. And the, this condition of the group being um, 
simple and, and compact means that there's actually one dimensional space of invariant inner products. But I want to know which one I'm picking. Um, so I'll just do it in the way which I think is easiest, which is to say if G equals SU2, then this thing um, for, say, xy is minus trace of xy. And why do I put in minus? Because if I don't put in minus, this is not positive definite. Um, and um, if the group is sun as opposed to su2, the same formula will work. And if the group is something else, um, then this is the smallest um, positive definite gene-variant inner product, such that when restricted to every SU2 subgroup, you get an integer multiple of this. One way of saying what it is. Another way of saying what it is, if you, if you know a bit of Lee theory, is to say that it's a thing that assigns uh, um, norm square 2 um, to the short code roots. That's, uh, if that's more enlightening, that's another way of saying the same thing. Or to the long roots, that's another way of saying the same thing. Anyways, it's a particular normalization called the basic inner product, and I'm going to be using it very soon. Um, and that's why I wanted to just say what it is. Um, so, equipped with that basic inner product, we can write down a co-cycle on this thing. Um, the co-cycle if I take f and g in here, f and g in here, then I'm going to write the following co-cycle, um, which is um, uh, omega of f g is, let me get the formula right to the normalization. So I guess it's a, there's a one over two pi i, um, and then integral over s1, of f dg. And that's a bit of a funny notation. Uh, I got used to it, but I remember being really confused by it. Um, f is a g-valued function. If I take a function and I apply uh, the, the RAM differential, I get a one form. So that's going to be a g-valued one form. So now we have a function and a one form. And I'm supposed to do two things at the same time. I'm supposed to multiply the function in the one form. I'm also supposed to take this inner product. So um, the way I like to think about it is to say FDG is a Lie algebra, tensor Lie algebra valued one form. And then I take that thing and I hit it with this linear map and I get a real valued one form. Um, so that's real valued. And I put here an i, so it's now with values in i times the reals. Um, great, so we have a cocycle. Let's, um, is it worth checking that this is an, indeed a cocycle? Um, why not? So here's a quick computation. That's going to just check that this is a co-cycle. Um, so integral of fg dh. Um, that's the same thing by integrating by parts as minus um, integral of df g comma h minus integral of f dg comma h, so that's by parts. Um, next thing that you do is you use the g invariance of the inner product. The g invariance is the, is the formula that says that x, y, z equals x, y, z. That's the way of writing at the Lie algebra level that an inner product is invariant under the Lie group. 
So we use that to move things around. Um, so that's minus df uh, gh, um, and then plus dg fh. And if you look at those three terms that we have, this, this, and that, they're really obtained by taking f, g, and h and permuting them um, cyclically. So you put them on the same side, and then that's exactly the co-cycle condition. It says that this plus its two cyclic permutations of the f, g, h symbols is equal when you add up that, that's zero. So it's a co-cycle. Um, okay. More importantly, this happens to be a universal um, co-cycle. It's, it's, it's a co-cycle describing the universal central extension of this Lie algebra. I, I will not do that computation, but that's going to give you that as a fact. Um, then uh, let's see what do we do. Uh, you can then apply this machine that integrates something. And you get a uh, central extension of LG by this abelian Lie algebra. Except that we get a thing which is this abelian Lie algebra modulo the set of periods. And now we need to actually know what the periods are um, because this group has non trivial pi 2. That's a thing that I mentioned earlier. And so we can take this uh, bilinear form at the Lie algebra level and take it in, make it into a Duram uh, differential form, a, a two form on the Lie group on this big thing. And then we can integrate it again against the generator of pi two, and we get an actual number. And these normalizations make it so that this number is exactly two pi i, and so we end up with. Uh, i r divided by 2 pi i, which is something that I will conveniently write as u1. Um, so that's the central extension which is relevant when the level k is equal to 1. When the level k is something else, then the relevant central extension is obtained by a pushout where I look at the map z maps to z to the k, and then I form a new thing, which I'm going to denote like that, with a sub k. So the bottom line is the central extension, the level k central extension of the loop. This one is no longer a universal central extension. This one is a universal central extension. Okay, so let's see. Back to the stated goal, which is to describe some examples. Right now, I've just described some examples of Lie algebras. Um, I'm going to define these categories, C of S, as being the categories of these Lie, the categories of representations of these Lie algebras. Um, this is a push out. So uh, very concretely. Uh, very concretely, if you take this central subgroup U1 inside there, you can look at the group, the cyclic group of order K of faith roots of unity, you just mod out by that group. And then you get the quotient of this. So this is a quotient map where you mod out by this thing. Um, this U1 modulo roots of unity is isomorphic to u1 and therefore I just call it u1 again. And this quotient map then becomes z goes to z to the k. Um, so this is just a, just a plain group quotient construction. There's like nothing difficult. Um, and it's also a push out. So, okay, so when 
um, writing things like that, um, I needed to pick coordinates in order to write things like that because this ln, ln is minus, uh, now I need to remember the exact formula. I think it's z to the n plus one d by dz. Uh, that's a thing that depends on a coordinate. I can't write this down unless I have the standard circle here. And I want to do something that you can do on any circle, that you don't need to do it on the standard circle. Once you know that um, this Lie algebra is a, not just a central extension, but is a universal central extension. Uh, universal central extensions are things that are unique up to unique isomorphism. And so either they exist, in which case you just need to say universal central extension is like a thing that's well defined, or they don't exist. Um, here, we can check that it exists when our circle is the standard circle. And if I take another circle, which is not the standard circle, well, it's an isomorphically algebra. So the property of having a universal central extension is preserved by isomorphism. And you can just say, I'm going to look at the universal central extension of this, uh, of this Lie algebra where I put an R a circle, like another manifold, which is not the circle, but like another circle, or possibly a disjoint unit circle. Isn't that? You just take the direct sum of Lie algebras. Um, so, yeah. So here, um, in the case of the Carroll minimal models, we define the category associated to a one manifold S to be, um, well, if the manifold is a disjoint unit of circles, you know how to, you're supposed to recover You can recover the category as a tensor product of the categories associated to the individual connected one manifold. So it's enough to tell you what this is when S is connected. Um, so when S is connected, you take um, the vector fields on S, and then you take the um, universal central extension of that. And um, there's a canonical uh, copy of um, the complex numbers in the center. And then you ask that the standard generator acts by uh, C times the identity, where C is the central charge. And so then you take, um, so rep, and then there's this condition that like, um, where should I put it here? The standard generator maps to C of this thing here. Um, and uh, for this one there. Oh, sorry, so abstractly, so this doesn't depend on C, right? Because you turn always with J uh, on the center. Yeah, so this thing here is just the universal central extension of this Lie algebra. There's no dependence on the central charge, but the center of that universal central extension is canonically isomorphic to the complex numbers. It's like um, you can name the elements of the center. And then I'm putting a particular restriction of this element, which I have called one, in the, for representation to be in here, this element needs to act as C times the identity. So it's a subcategory of, of the representations of this Lie algebra. Yeah, that's fine. But uh, so as a uh, additive category, maybe so it doesn't depend on C, uh, I guess. Right? It does. Uh, it does. But so can't you just be scaled uh, to more cycle by uh, dilation? Get that sort of the algebra with the monkeys and the universal extension. So in this coordinate dependent way. You're looking for operators ln, ln that satisfy this equation. Um, and if you try to rescale the operators to make a different number appear here, you will also make a number appear there. And so you're just not allowed to rescale the number. 
uh, the, these operators. Oh, so I, I just meant that the so two more cycles can be restored to uh, other classes. Uh, you yeah. have this extension. Uh, I mean, two more cycle describing the extension. Uh, yeah, but I'm just looking at this particular okay. formula, and I'm saying I want operators ln for every n in z satisfying these algebraic relations. I'm looking at the category of things with operators like that. Yeah, he's saying that the central owner has to act by the identity. Yeah, but, so there's no distinguished push. I mean, uh, there's no sort of uh, intrinsic way to say where the bar is in the system. Where the what? Where, where, the, uh, where this element bar is in the system. There is. There is. Okay. So, um, so there, the center of the universal central extension of this Lie algebra is canonically isomorphic to the complex numbers. Yeah, I.e. there so is a distinguished element that you can name. But so it's a commutative Lie algebra. Uh, That's so right. Mistreating gives the automorphism of this commutative Lie algebra. But these automorphisms of the commutative Lie algebra do not extend to automorphisms of this non-commutative Lie algebra, which is this whole thing. So the, the, the fact that it is the center of this centrally extended Lie algebra actually completely identifies this center and you're no longer, there's no longer any automorphisms that rescale the center. So um, the, the definition of, a, of an extension being a universal central extension means that for any other extension, there's a unique homomorphism to, uh, sorry, from the universal central extension. In particular, you can take the central extension, the universal central extension, and again the universal central extension. There's a unique homomorphism that makes the diagram commute. In particular, that homomorphism cannot rescale the center because otherwise it wouldn't be unique. Otherwise, I would have the identity and then something else that rescales the center. So, um, Um, and then here, I'm going to, um, again, there's a way of saying it at the Lie algebra level. I'll say it at the Lie group level. I'm going to say it's representation of this particular group. Um, LG tilde K. Um, so I could either say I'm looking at representations of this group where the center acts by this character that goes to the z to the k, or I could say it's representations of that group where the center acts by the identity. Um, so u1 acts um, by the identity. Um, okay, so I've written some some categories. Um, let's see what um, we want to do right now. These descriptions are not very precise. Um, and they're not very precise because I haven't said anything about which representations I'm allowing. If you just say like that, it's all representations, um, you get a category that's way too big. And um, the key concept which is missing from, from this description is the concept of a positive energy representation. So let me um, tell you what that is. Um, So the Soro sub C is uh, this thing here in, in red. Uh, um, So 
I want the operator L0 to be diagonalizable with discrete, swep, discrete spectrum um, bounded from below. Um, and finite dimensional eigenspaces. L0 is the energy operator in this business, and uh, you want the energy to um, have zero eigenspaces when you go to minus infinity and to have everything that goes to plus infinity. And moreover, I'm going to ask that it has discrete spectrum that each eigenspace is final dimensional. Um, yes, that's the way in which I like to, to set up things. Um, it's um, If you work with Hilbert spaces, these operators here are going to be unbounded operators. Well, L0, you said, like has a spectrum that goes all the way up to infinity. And uh, one needs to be um, a little bit specific by what one means by that. One needs to ask for the existence of a common then subspace on which these operators are all defined so that I can talk about this thing here. And then you also need to say that there closed and that the adjoint of Ln is L minus N and stuff like that. Um, there's other ways of setting up the theory where you take your underlying vector space to just be this dense subspace on which all these operators are defined. And then the spaces are no longer Hilbert spaces, but you write this and you no longer have to say, oh, my operators are not defined everywhere. Um, so there's sort of two ways of, of doing the same, the same story. Um, the, the category that you get at the end, you need to make sure that it's still always the same. So you, you shouldn't allow in your category both Hilbert spaces and things which are not Hilbert spaces because then it becomes two different objects. You have too many objects in your category, so that's not allowed. Um, so um, that's a positive energy representation of this thing here. And then um, now I need to tell you the corresponding definition for the loop groups, um, an irreducible representation of, um, and because this is phrased at the Lyadra level, and the definition of positive mm -hmm. energy for here is going to piggyback on the definition for this, I'm going to switch to the Lyadra level uh, definition here. So uh, this representation of LG tilde K, which is just the Lie algebra of this thing here. Um, has positive energy if it extends to a representation of the semi-direct product here sorrow sub c acting on this thing here uh, for some central charge c um, this is vector fields on something on on s and this is functions on s with values in um, in g and there's an obvious action of diffeomorphisms on functions by reparameterizations at the Lyadra level. It's a, an action of vector fields on this. So you can talk about um, the symmetry product. Um, extends this, um, comma, and the Vera Soro has positive energy. Now we have an operator L0, and now we can ask that it has positive spectrum. Um, and then um, a representation 
of LGK has positive energy if it's a finite direct sum of positive energy irreducible representations. And you might wonder why I put it in such a way where I first define it for irreducibles and then define the general thing to be a direct sum of irreducibles. It's because the definition is a bit fiddly, and if you do it in the other way around, um, there's just ways of, um, yeah, there's ways of, um, for example, I could take, uh, say, that, say I took the case k equals zero, in which case this is a, a Lyapunov that is not centrally extended. Um, I took the trivial one-dimensional representation of this of this Lie algebra, and then I tensored it with a random positive energy representation of Vera Soro. And you would get something that on the face of it satisfies this condition, but clearly you don't want it. And so you need to set up things in this particular way for it to not have these. Yeah. Do you want to say the same C? Where's that? That is something that I do not need to say, but because that's automatic. I just hope you avoid this deep run definition by, uh, instead of saying it extends to some representation, that said the Siegel Su R extension. The uh, extension, if it exists, is unique. And so um, there's no need to specify how the extension works. But yes, indeed, there's a particular formula called the Siegel, Siegel Sugar Wire formula that will actually produce these. Um, uh, these operators satisfying all the necessary permutation relations given a representation of the affine Lie algebra. Um, okay, so that's a um, already slightly more precise description of these categories. Um, and um, So, um, and so now let me be uh, even more precise and address Dave's comments about whether or not we want things to be unitary or not. Um, yes, I do want things to be unitary. So I will be, that's my chalk. Um, um, So, and I also lost where the thing is. No, Not there. Um, so here, if I just write this thing, that's not good enough. I need to also put the condition that these have positive energy. Positive energy, and here also we need to put positive energy. Um, here, if you say positive energy, that takes care of everything. You have a category which is, which is well-defined. We're talking about um, Hilbert spaces equipped with a continuous unitary action of this topological group and this condition, that's fine. Um, here, if you say things that have positive energy, that does not take care of everything. There still exist non-unitary representations which do have the positive energy condition, and so you need to add uh, unitary by hand in order to make the category have um, uh, this uh, property of having only finitely many simple objects. Otherwise, they're just too many. Um, so... Very explicit about, you say, these Carl minimal models and Category. Yes, um, one can be very explicit. So, um, yeah, so let me tell you how many objects these categories have. Um, I don't have any boards left. Okay. 
I'll do it here. So there's this parameter m, and um, so this thing here has um, m times n minus one over two. <coughs> simple objects, and the best way to think about these objects, about this set that parameterizes the set of simple objects, is to think of it as being a grid of m times m minus 1 dots um, modulo the action of um, rotation by 180 degrees. So this is a set that has cardinality m times m minus 1 over 2, namely the quotient of the set of dots by this rotation. Uh, and that is the set which most naturally parameterizes the ereps of, of Virasoro. And um, the, um, this, this ends up being um, modular tensor category and the fusion rules for this thing are the fusion rules for um, SU2 level M uh, SU2 level like SU2 level M times SU2 level M plus one. Um, so if this is an object X, uh, uh, this is the object one, and I call this object X and this object Y that's going to be x times y, and then uh, the sum of this and that is x squared, and the sum of this and that is y squared. And, uh, and sometimes you end up writing an object there that's the same as the object over there, but that's fine, you just pass to the quotient. Um, so that's a, a quick description of, of what this category has. Um, and maybe I can do a similar quick description for this. So here, um, the, the set of irreducible objects for this is um, so representations of G are classified by their highest weight. The highest weight is an element of the weight lattice which lives in a particular cone inside the weight lattice. So we have <coughs> the weight lattice, and inside the weight lattice there is cone, positive cone, um, of things that are so-called dominant weights. There's possible highest weights of irreps of G. Um, if I have a representation of this loop group, which is irreducible positive energy, I can take its lowest energy subspace, and that's going to be a finite dimensional thing with an action of the finite dimensional Lie algebra, and that will have a highest weight, and the set of possible highest weights um, is a subset of this set of all highest weights, and the subset is defined by cutting this cone by a hyperplane, and the distance between the origin and this hyperplane is roughly k. So you end up with a finite set of points that um, fit into a simplex whose size grows with k. Sorry, so for the case of Virasoro algebra, uh, it is uh, actually uh, something like equivalent relation between product of uh, repressive two twos for m minus one. Yes, you take that? SU2 times SU2 at yeah. levels m and n plus one, yeah. and then uh, and we have this uh, one and the, sort of the other opposite, which form uh, algebra. That's exactly right. Um, okay, well, what have I done? I've spent a lot of time and I've just given you some categories that depend on one manifold. I haven't told you anything about, well, I guess the forgetful functor is sort of obvious because I realize these categories as concrete categories. They're categories of representations of something, so there's an obvious underlying vector space. Um, but how about this? That's sort of the most important part, and I have a 
left so a small amount of time to tell you roughly what's going on. So let me try to do justice to this in the time that I have. So I will do it for just the WCW model and possibly tomorrow I will do it for the minimal models. Um, it, is there, it is substantially simpler to do it in this case than to do it in that. So I will do it in this case. Um, <coughs> okay, so we have complex cobordism. Um, as usual, and it has some incoming and some outgoing circles. And we take um, a representation um, H in um, representations of um, so. Here, what did I write? I wrote LG, but LG is a thing that was defined making um, explicit reference to a certain one manifold, S1, the standard circle. Um, there's no need for that circle to be the standard circle. I can put here the thing which I have. So if I call this, um, call this manifold S1, and call this manifold S2, S1 in this case is not connected, doesn't need to be connected. I can take everything here and replace S upper one by S lower one, and everything works just fine. Uh, this works fine, this works fine, this works fine. So again, an integral over something. Um, everything works fine. Um, and so we have um, maps from S1 into G, and then you centrally extend using this formula and then you do this particular push out and then you get uh, the level k central extension and then you do that and then you say that it has to be positive energy so you put the positive energy there um, so we have this whole thing now we have an object in here and we want to hit it with um, uh, with this functor and get an object on the other side. Um, <coughs> I need Um, so um, let me give a name also for the action. So this is a representation, it's like V comma rho. V is the underlying vector space, rho is the action. Um, it's image W comma pi. Um, under I want to talk about both the image as a vector space and also the linear map that is the comparison so it's an it's a representation but there's also um, the map z sigma and it's just a linear map from the to W. Um, under, so there was um, so S is the functor from 
c of s1 to c of s2. And z is this natural transformation, this linear map from, well, I just wrote it, from the underlying vector space of v to the underlying vector space of w. And that's why I sort of was specific to say v comma rho and w comma pi, because this is a map that's just a linear map. It's not compatible with actions. Actually, the things that act on it are just different V algebras or different V groups. So it doesn't make sense to ask that it's equivariant. So it's image under this. Um, so I'll define it by means of some universal property. And I'm going to say it satisfies some formula. And it's universal with respect to the fact that it satisfies the formula. And every other thing that satisfies the formula, there's a unit. And the formula is the following. Uh, so these are so-called Siegel computation relations. And they read as follows. Uh, pi of f out circle z sigma equals z sigma circle rho of f in uh, for every f in holomorphic function. So holomorphic function on sigma with values in the Lie algebra, the complexified Lie algebra. Um, and is universal with respect to the property of satisfying so if i have a pair w pi which is an object of c of s2 together with a linear map like that satisfying that property i'm going to require the existence of a unique comparison map from um, um, where does it go now? This is a, an induction. So from this one into my other candidate, uh, making some obvious diagrams commute. Um, so, so this defines um, a functor. So we have. Um, Um, this part of the definition is okay to, to define, and I have just defined it, and there's like no problems. Um, I did make some comments at the very beginning how um, these, these examples have not been fully constructed. So now let me uh, tell you what is the thing that hasn't been done. Um, so what you really want to know is that if I have sigma one and then sigma two, and I do it for sigma one, and then I do it again for sigma two, it's the same thing as doing it for the glued surface, sigma one union sigma two. Um, that is not clear. That is not uh, something which is known. That is not something that I know how to prove. That is not something that anybody knows how to prove um, with, the, with this definition. Um, or, um, and, uh, or with any other definition, this has not been done. Uh, so let me tell you why this is a bit tricky. Um, so when you have a thing defined like that by universal property, um, it's kind of, it feels like it should be easy to do. You just do it. It's, a, it's like an induction. Like you have a Lie algebra, another Lie algebra, a map of Lie algebras, you induce. You sort of have a natural way of, a natural construction for doing this. Thing. Um, If you do it in a world where you're free to do your constructions just like you want to do them, 
um, then you do it once and you do it again, then it works well with respect to composition. In this world, we have imposed a condition that um, is, is making our life much harder, and that's the condition of positive energy. Um, so effectively, what you're doing is you're saying, I'm going to do this universal thing. I'm going to see what I get, but I'm going to do it in some world where I don't impose the positive energy condition. And then whatever I get, I'm going to throw out the summons that's, that fail this condition. That's what it means to do this universal construction in a world where you have arbitrary, bizarre conditions. <laughs> so, you, so essentially, you do this induction, and then you throw out the parts that don't have positive energy. And then you do the thing again, and then throw out the parts that don't have positive energy. And the question is, is that the same thing as doing it all at once? and throwing out the parts that don't have positive energy. And that's no longer obvious, because you could have a thing that, where you start something that has positive energy, you do the first step, you get some summons that don't have positive energy, and then you apply again the thing for the second, and then you get some summons that do have positive energy, and then it's not clear that it's the same to do it in one step or in two steps. And so what feels like, uh, should be the right way of attacking this problem is to prove that if you do this construction, this universal construction, in a world where you don't impose the positive energy condition, that the result of this thing, the, the universal gadget that satisfies these things, automatically, for some uh, just magical reason, will have positive energy. Um, well, this is, this is something that... Uh, Graham Siegel has tried for a very long time to make it work, and uh, it's not, it's not really, it's expected to work. It's some, some variant of this story will work. But, um, anyways, but at least you have, you have a definition. Thanks, sorry for going over time. philosophical reason where you get a central, uh, where you get one central extension for each level? Um, no, you can set up things so that they look exactly the same. So for, for Virasoro, I've done it here in a way where the central extension does depend on um, on the on the central charge, um, there's sort of two ways of setting up things that are equivalent. One of them is to say I'm going to look at representations of the universal central extension, where I specify how the center should act. That's one way of doing it. Or the other way of doing it is to say I'm going to build a central extension which depends on, um, in this case, the central charge or in that case, the level, um, and I'm going to ask that the center acts in the, tr in the standard way. So in this particular case, it would be like the center acts in the standard way, and here I said the center acts in the standard way. So yes, I, I did one thing here and the other thing there, which, um, and, and I, both here and there, there's sort of two things you can say that are equivalent. Um, it's a, it's a of why you expect to see SU2 the 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 I don't have a good answer of why you might expect to see SU2 from there. I mean, there's, there are some constructions you can make starting from SU2. You said you take an 
unless you two cross another rest field two and then you do a thing and then you compute what you get and at the end you're like, oh, I got the RSR, but it's not an explanation. I wanted to make sure I understood uh, the way you use this universal property. So, to this cohortism, to each, to the ingoing and the outgoing, you assign a category. Yes. And to sigma, you assign a functor, which is defined on a given V row by this universal property. So, you have C of S1. C of S2, a category of vector spaces or topological vector spaces, a forgetful functor, a forgetful functor, and we're constructing two things at the same time. We're constructing a functor F and a natural transformation Z. So um, given an object here, the co row, we're constructing two things. We're constructing its image under S, which I'm calling W comma pi, and we're constructing a linear map between what you obtain by forgetting the actions. So here's the linear map. It's just a map from D to W.